I wanted to uh, bring up on stage um, Jadeep Sandhu, who is the Chief Technology Officer of the Renewables Global Business Unit at Angie. Uh, Jedi joins us and well, was a nice little surprise addition to our program uh, because he kindly agreed to do this without any warning whatsoever. So and I don't know what you're going to ask him. <laughs> no, and he has no idea what I'm going to ask him. So give him a round of applause for being brave enough to come up here. Um, Oji has seen a lot of changes over the years. You've been brave enough to do them. Uh, your senior leadership has been brave enough to take a hit for doing them, including yourself in some, in some respects. Tell us what is the journey of a brave energy company at this point? What does it look like? What does it need to look like? So firstly, as you know, uh, historically we were an oil and gas company, or I should say gas company, and, with, and, and, and a lot of power generation as well. And we decided to make the transition in time and be a transition leader. So move from fossil to green. Uh, and we took that courageous decision. We made lots of changes. We announced it to the market. Of course, that brings the challenges. So firstly, people want to see the predictability of what you want to do. Secondly, you have to demonstrate that you really have not only a story, but you can deliver on that story. So we started making all those changes. Uh, we started, uh, you know, we made the declaration we won't do any more coal. We started getting rid of coal, exiting coal, not only by shutting down plants, but also looking at how we can modify our existing coal-fired plants to other types of facilities. Uh, then we started building a lot of renewables. We were already had quite a lot of hydro assets, by the way, but then really go big into wind and solar. And that's the change we are doing now. And the intention is, and a declared commitment, in fact, that by 2045 we will be net zero carbon which is, from a company which had a huge carbon footprint, uh, quite a brave thing to do. What does that bravery entail? Because at some point when I ask people this question when they're talking about transitioning, it does come back to, oh, we need standards and we need to convince our investors, we need to convince our shareholders and our stakeholders. Um, you have, uh, your company deals with a combination of policy making, issues and the politics of it all and the money of it all, how do you balance it to get to where you need to get to? Yes, so firstly, we work in many different countries. Uh, most of our gas business is in France and in, and in Brazil, but we work in many, many different countries. So we have to be aware of policies and how they're emerging in each of the markets we're working in. Secondly, we have to make sure that we are deploying technologies which are fast to market. Because at the end of the day, if we want to transition, we want to transition fast. We have to make sure that as we are retiring facilities or changing facilities, the new generation is there already picking up. So we don't have that big lag in time. The markets won't forgive you. The investors won't forgive you if you say that, OK, if three years, give us some time, and we will bring the transition. And in three years, you haven't delivered it. So that's what we started doing. We started working on projects upfront working with the financial markets, working on a pipeline of projects, and making sure that we had those assets being built and delivered as we were getting out of some of the other business. And that's what has actually helped stabilize and create the necessary interest. Um, and we've also seen the changes in the way we are actually marketing that energy. So not only working with contracts for differences or with um, let's say, utility type of PPAs, but also working with corporate clients to incorporate PPAs. So we also had to find the mechanisms on how we market that energy differently. How do we differentiate ourselves from others? Um, and fortunately, with renewables, the costs have come down, so we were able to do it competitively at cost as well. Um, and as you can imagine, in the beginning, a lot of the renewables were you, you sell or you supply as generated. But now the customers are saying, sorry, I also want a dispatch profile. So this is where we started working on projects now in which we're working on, with hybridization. So we're working with wind and solar, which are complementary resources in some markets, adding a bit of storage to it, putting in some hydro generation as well. And it's then, a holistic approach at some point, which sounds like it works for the business. Um, and the technology deployment yeah. is also about having vision to look much, much further ahead in time and move fast. Yeah. How do you, um, at some point, when you go back to your actual stakeholders and they suddenly don't like what they see. How do you convince them to stay on board, stay the course, yeah. it's worth the pain? Yeah, so firstly, um, our net zero 
is also dependent on our customers trying to drive uh, their net zero. So firstly, we have to work with them and understand what they want and convince them that it's in their interest as well towards moving towards the net zero. And to be honest, it's not a big, difficult uh, discussion. Is it a more difficult discussion when, it, when you end up talking to your shareholders? I think the difficult discussion ends up if it's going to add cost. Yeah, so we have to make sure that we are being able to do that competitively and ensure that they're still getting value for money. Yeah, so, so that's the first thing. And one of the ways you start doing it is that you say, okay, we will be your energy supplier. You don't have to invest in an asset or whatever. We will do that, we will manage all that risk of it. We guarantee you a certain delivery of energy and at this cost. And as, the, and as the demand increases and the technology becomes cheaper, in the future it'll be cheaper by that much more. So that they have to buy into your story, you have to understand their story and make the two match. The two match uh, works and then if you, if you do match, yep. how do you have long-term vision at this point? What would be the tips and tricks that you would leave in terms of people who were here on the stage before us talking about innovation moving very fast? Yep but incumbents not moving as fast as some of these young innovators. Yeah, so it's a couple of things there. So firstly, uh, if you're trying to do things at scale, you need to raise capital as well. We can't do anything, everything on balance sheet. So to do it on, to raise capital, we need to have, firstly, the client. Mm. We need to have the project. We need to have a credible uh, production profile, and we need to have a credible revenue stream. So once we've done that and we've demonstrated it, then you can raise the capital. Uh, obviously, that then helps you to leverage and do different things. Uh, and secondly, when it comes to innovation, obviously we have to be on top of it. So even in most standard technologies like solar PV or onshore wind, there's quite a lot of innovation happening. Then the next innovation is not in business models as well. There's also innovation in how you bring storage together to meet somebody's demand profile. And then, of course, we also look at what do we do with the excess energy? Because sometimes to meet somebody's demand profile, we'll have to overbuild the capacity. So with the excess capacity, instead of curtailing it, can I use it to make hydrogen, for example? So you're making the maximum use of your asset to do different things and provide different services, which allows you to do things innovative. Also, when the lenders look at it, let's say I'm putting in some hydrogen electrolyzers with a very large solar PV and wind development. Um, and this is to just use the extra energy. The lenders don't perceive that as a big risk because the big risk would be if I was doing a very large hydrogen production facility with a dedicated solar PV resource for the first time. But here you're looking at, you're proving the technology first. So you're doing certain things which look like demonstrators, but strictly speaking, they're already commercial demonstrators. And then the next step would be, we'd be able to do it at scale. How do you tie what you want to do and what you know makes business sense when you have to then tie it back to the policies of the country that the company is based in. Yeah. Sometimes that overlap is painful and sometimes that overlap works. So in a scenario where we're, talk where we're talking about NDCs needing to be uh, more aggressive yeah. and stay the course, give us an example of the ONGI um, experience about policy making and the overlap of where you want to be as a business. So generally speaking, what we've found is that the policies are a bit lagging. So in terms of support which you need, it's a bit lagging. Some countries are a bit more powerful, a bit more active, I would say. But generally speaking, policy is coming behind. So we are really having to work with the regulators, with the policy makers up front and say, OK, this is what the market can do. This is what the private sector can do for you. And hopefully, we be able to get, get things done. But um, yeah, so the, the experience in each market has been different. So in, in parts of the US it's been pretty good, in some other parts not so good. Uh, in Europe as well, you've got, depending on the technology, different experiences, but, but on the whole, I think it's, it's getting there. And it's getting there. That is a positive note to end on indeed. Thank you so very much, Eddie, thank for, you your, so for much, your conversation. Martin. Thank you very much for and having me. For, for coming on stage without any preparation whatsoever. You're a brave man indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.